welcome to episode two of ITL Voices. I am Moemi Adipi and I'll be your host for today. So I want to say a very big thank you for joining us uh, today and we'd like to know where everyone is joining us from. Please drop a comment in the comment section below. Tell us your location and that's if you can. And don't forget to subscribe to get alerts when a new episode is available. Uh, we hope you enjoyed every bit of our last episode and today we have a very special guest for everyone. She's joining us all the way from Ottawa and her name is Deborah Wu. Uh, Ms. Wolf is the Executive Director of NCA, which is known as the National Committee on Accreditation and Law School Program with the Federation of Law Societies in Canada. The NCA is a standing committee of the Federation of Law Societies of Canada. And uh, the NCA assesses the qualifications of individuals with legal education and professional experience that has been obtained outside of Canada or in a Canadian civil law program who wish to be admitted to common law by in Canada. Hi, Deborah, and welcome to ITL Voices. It's really great to have you here as our guest. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to meet you. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure most of the people watching today do not probably know that you are not a lawyer, but I'm very curious. Like, Can you tell us how you came to be involved with internationally trained lawyers? Yes, um, so I was in the Canadian Armed Forces and I, I left them to join uh, the, with an organization that's now called Engineers Canada. It's the same organization as the Federation of Law Societies. It's the national body of the um, regula regulators in the provinces and territories. And th through my 15 years with Engineers Canada, I built an expertise in the evaluation of uh, international credentials. And so when the Federation was looking for someone to revamp and improve the NCA, um they hired me oh okay that that's quite interesting uh so let's talk about nca itself on the subject of assessment which process does the nca follow to determine the courses or the subjects an internationally trained lawyer must satisfy and also like how can an internationally trained lawyer actually get licensed to practice law in canada so um in canada the authority or the legislative authority for licensing lawyers similar to many of the other professions but not all of them it rests with the provinces um, and the, so the law societies in the various provinces and territories have that authority and they got together and they asked the federation to take on the role of evaluating people who are educated outside of canada or people coming out of quebec um, in or a civil law canadian civil law program into one of the common law provinces the Federation to do that set um, a policy that's called the National Requirement for Canadian Common Law Programs. So that document applies both to the Canadian law schools that are teaching common law programs and to the NCA. And so what we do is we use that document to set our policies and it lays out a number of different um, aspects, including knowledge competencies. So that's where you get Canadian constitutional law, Canadian criminal law and our, our eight subjects. It lays out skills, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes, I think. Um, the skills around um, oral and written legal communications, around um, legal ethics, and it also lays out for Canadian law schools um, the resources that they need to, to run the law school. So we take that document, we translate it into the policies for the NCA, and then we apply those policies to the files when they come forward. So the process is, we assess the files, we assign people um, requirements, they then complete those requirements, they get a certificate, and that certificate of qualification is used similar to the um, a degree that you would get from a Canadian common law program to apply to the law society, and then they take you through bar admissions or the licensing process, which typically will include a course or exams, and exams, um, as well as articling, and that's how you get licensed. Thank you. Uh, so apart from self-studying uh, and writing the exams, there's the assigned courses and subjects that have been assigned by NCA. What other options are available to internationally trained lawyers to actually satisfy the assessments made by uh, the NCA? Is it possible to complete its requirements in more than one way? What do you think? Right, so when, when we assess a file, um, there, there's a variety of outcomes. Um, most people are told, here are the subjects that you need to complete. You can do them through the NCA exams or in an NCA approved course at a Canadian law school. Um, and so several of the Canadian law schools have developed programs specifically for NCA students. And they would um, 
they would, uh, people can choose to go into one of those programs or take our exams. Now, some people have to go back to law school and have to attend law school in order to get through the NCA. Um, and so they don't have the choice, but those same programs, and they are at University of British Columbia, um, University of Alberta, uh, University of Calgary is starting a program in um, September, and then Osgoode Hall Law School and University of Toronto. Now there's other law schools in Canada that will offer courses, but those are the schools that have specific NCA programs. Now people don't need to attend them, but it's an option um, apart from taking our exams. Okay, so that means there are options open for people to follow. That's okay, right. thank you. Uh, so still on the licensing process, I know internationally trained lawyers from civil law jurisdictions have a slightly different requirement. And some of them must complete their requirements through a law school, unlike their common law counterparts. So does the NCA actually have any plans to streamline this process or make it more flexible for ITLs from civil law background? So the concept for people coming from a civil law jurisdiction, or what we, we actually call it non-common law. So it could be civil law, it could be a religious law, it could be a combination of different legal traditions, but, but the, the, the bottom line is that there is no common law content in, that, in, that, um, in, the, in the legal tradition of uh, the law school in the jurisdiction where they completed it. Um, so it could be all of South and Central America, all of continental Europe, much of Asia. Um, so there's a lot of jurisdictions that are not common law. Um, we actually changed quite quite dramatically changed the policy in, on September 1st, 2019, and then in subsequent policy changes have continued this. Um, we opened it up quite a bit for um, for people who have come from a from a non common law jurisdiction, and we are now accepting if someone has a license as a paralegal or as a notary. Now, not a notary public, but a notary. Um, then we will allow them to come through into the process and write our exams. So let me clarify that. What that means is that if someone has a P1 license in Ontario, so let's say they um, took their law degree in, let's say, Brazil, they worked there for a few years as a lawyer, they came to Canada, they took a, a college program as a paralegal, they got licensed as a P1 in Ontario. What we'll do now is rather than sending them back to law school, um, we will allow them to complete our exams. If you, if you aren't coming through in a program like that, you do need to attend a common law law school in order to have that exposure to the common law. Now, you don't need to do a full degree, but you need to have exposure. It doesn't need to be in Canada. It could be in the United States. It could be in England. could be in Australia, but you have to have that exposure. Um, but when I say licensed paralegal, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, it, the other provinces don't have a licensed paralegal, but in British Columbia, they have a licensed notary. And those folks will attend law school and, and then they become a notary. And it's, it's almost like a, a notaire in Quebec where they are responsible for things like real estate transactions. So it's different than a lawyer, but it has that common law exposure to it. So the key is the common law exposure. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. We know previously uh, NCA courses were written in person as before the old pandemic and recently shifted to online proctored exams. How did this change affect the evaluation process and has this change come to stay? So it hasn't changed the evaluation process in terms of how we assess files or how our examiners mark the exams in terms of content. It's changed all of the tools that we use. Um, previously, prior to the pandemic, we had kind of thought about, mm, maybe we should go to online exams, but we, we know that the, the internationally trained lawyers are an incredibly diverse group. We've got 20 year old Canadians who went to other countries to take their law degree. We've got people who are, um, you know, maybe in their fifties or sixties, maybe even older who are coming from another country and maybe, and you know, so different levels of, of comfort with technology. But when we got to the pandemic, um, we really had to say, we can't, I mean, we canceled the May 2020 exams. And when we knew that the pandemic wasn't going to be over in a month or two, we knew that we couldn't continue to cancel the exams. And so we had to bring in another option and we chose to bring in online pro remotely proctored exams. So the examiners and our examiners are um, professors or senior practitioners in Canadian law schools. Um, our examiners continue to set our exams. They continue to mark the exams. Just now it's being done um, online, remotely proctored. And so um, the, 
the flexibility that this offers in terms of people not having to fly to Toronto or uh, we had a, a site in Delhi, fly to Delhi or London, England, you know, this is a really positive thing. There are problems, of course, and there was it was a bumpy implementation of that. Um, but the assessment itself has not changed. Now, we will not be going back to in-person exams. We will not be going back to handwritten exams. We are going to stay with online remotely proctored exams. The flexibility that it allows and the consistency and the ability for us to do quality assurance on our exams is, um, has, has shown to us that this is a far more attractive option for us. Okay, uh, I think that's a positive thing to hear. <laughs> I'm sure people watching are excited about that. I think uh, okay. some I think some are excited and some are probably not excited, but hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, the, the transition has been um, reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it has. Uh, okay, so there are times when MCA actually refuses to ask, access an applicant's profile due to reasons such as maybe poor academic performance or uh, the candidate of possessing an accredited law degree. So in situations like that, what options uh, like does the applicant actually have? So there's two different things here. There's refusing to assess a file and there's um, refusing to recognize the credentials upon assessment. So it is, it is an absolute requirement that anyone who comes to the NCA, they must have a first law degree. So it can't be someone who maybe in the jurisdiction got licensed through an apprenticeship route or an examination route, they actually have to have a law degree. So whether that's an LLB or a JD or a BCL, or I mean, there's all sorts of different letters that, that these degrees can be called. They have to have a first law degree. Now, when, and so if they don't, we will refund their assessment and say, you can't be assessed. Now for the folks who get an assessment, but who don't meet some of our basic requirements um, and, and the examples that you gave were good ones. And so um, people coming out of England or India, Nigeria, who have a third class or a past class degree, we will not recognize those credentials unless the individual has earned a subsequent credential. So it could be bar school, it could be um, an LLM, um, it could be um, licensure through substantive exams. So in that case, when it, whenever we see someone where their initial credentials don't allow us to give them uh, any recognition for their degree, we're always looking for something else in the file. Um, and we will tell them if they don't have something else to compensate for that initial issue, um, in their letter, they'll be told, in order to qualify, you need to do one of the following things. And so that can happen for people, as we just talked about, about with poor academic performance. But it also could be somebody who um, we already talked about the civil law degrees. Um, and then somebody who doesn't have an accredited law degree, again, they would need to get a new credential. So there are schools in the U.S., so in the United States, there's about 200 um, schools that are accredited by the American Bar Association. But then there's a whole bunch of other schools that are either not accredited accredited or they are accredited by a state. We will not accept those. But let's give an example of somebody who did their law degree through an unaccredited program in California, but then they wrote the California bar exams and were called to the bar in California. Those people, we will then continue them through the process and, um, and assign them the exams that, um, that are appropriate for their background. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so recently there was a new requirement that was added. So I think less we can have a little chat about that. So a new requirement was added to the assessment, which is actually conditioned on demonstrating competency in legal research and writing. Uh, this requirement does not appear to be too popular with internationally trained lawyers. Would you like to shed some light on why the NCA took this decision and what objective this requirement seeks to achieve? Yes, so I mentioned earlier that there's a document called the National Requirement, and that document um, is approved by all of the law societies, and we are obliged to implement it, both for the Canadian law schools and for the NCA. Um, one of the skills in the National Requirement is um, Canadian legal research and writing. Um, and, and so we're obliged to ensure that everyone who gets a certificate or everybody who gets a JD from, a, from an approved Canadian program has demonstrated competency in this area. Um, and, and, prior, and, and so the national requirement came into effect on January 1st, 2015. And we did not at that time have the capacity to build a, a, some sort of a tool that would allow us to assess this competency. Um, and what we did at the time is we said, 
everybody has come has graduated from a law school coming through the NCA and they're writing our exams, we're going to deem that to be sufficient. But we know that that's actually not sufficient. Um, because people are coming from a wide variety and diversity of other um, of other programs and systems. And um, I, I think that we would recognize that terminology is different in different countries. Even Canada to the US is very different in terms of the terminology and the structure of the profession. Um, even though we are you know, right across the border and probably our closest friend in terms of trade and all sorts of different areas, um, the terminology is very different. And, and so we were actually, the NCA was actually not compliant with this aspect of the national requirement. So we were obliged to bring in a program. We have um, partnered with uh, CPLED, which is the um, bar admissions process for Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia on a program that we believe is, um, it, obviously it meets the requirements of the national requirement, but we also believe that it will be very useful for people coming through. And about 40 or 50 NCA students have come through it already. And um, to a person, they have all said that they learned, that they were able to hone their skills, um, that they understand better the legal research um, uh, tools that are available or, or that are required to be used, and that they were they got personal feedback on, on skills around um, writing and research and, and, and those types of skills. And so we have no option but to bring in this, this, um, this competency assessment. And as I mentioned earlier, all of the Canadian law schools are also required to do this and they are all doing it. So um, the way the policy is written is that anyone whose file is assessed in January, well, starting January 1st, 2022, we won't be assessing files on January 1st, 2022, but you know what I mean. Um, starting in uh, the policy comes into effect for January 1st, 2022. If your file is assessed after that date, you will be required to, to demonstrate competency in this area. And there, the two ways to demonstrate that competency will be to complete the course uh, or module, we call it with CPLED, or to take an NCA approved course from a Canadian law school. So I started to talk to the Canadian law schools about what they're doing for their JD students. And I would expect to see a number of the Canadian law schools start to open up those courses to the NCA students as an option. So this is, this is something that we're required to do. And I think that um, while some people may think, oh, I don't wanna have to do that. It's gonna, you know, this is gonna slow me down. It's another requirement. It will cost some money. But I think that what I hope what people will take from it is that, it will improve their skills and it will um, set them up greater for success in the next steps, which is licensing and bar admissions and then in practice. Uh, so just pulling from that, it means from January 1st, 2022, everybody that gets assessed will be required to write it, regardless of uh, where you schooled, what jurisdiction you're coming from. That's right. That's right. So people who are, who already have an assessment or people whose file get assessed before December or in December um, 2021, they will not have to do it. They, they may choose. Someone may say, oh, you know what, I'm struggling with my writing or I'd like a little bit more, um, uh, like a little bit more help around writing. They may choose to do the module, um, but the only people who are required to do it is people who have their file assessed after January 1st, 2022. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm very certain that everyone watching this will agree with me that this has been very interesting and insightful. And uh, I'm certain we've all learned one or two things from Deborah today, especially for the ITLs who are just passing their licensing process in Canada. So I want to say a very big thank you for taking out your time and busy schedule to join us today, Deborah. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And, and I would like to say to everyone, um, please go to our website, nca.legal. If you have questions about the process, you'll find a lot of information there. And I wish you all the best as you go through your NCA process. I hope you all succeed. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us on episode two of ITL Voices. Uh, bye for now, everyone.